I, I'm, I'm coming to you from the practical end of the spectrum, and I hope it's not too big of a whiplash in, in so doing so right after lunch. But Rolf asked me to talk about two very, um, as I say up here, recklessly ambitious models that I've worked on over the last 20 years. And what I really want to talk about the most is what I've learned from those um, two projects. But I have to tell you a little bit about the models themselves in order for you to get a good idea of what I've survived in order to understand my mindset when I put some of these things on you. So my two models are the Transportation and Land Use Model Integration Program in Oregon called TULUMIP, which is recently coming to the end of its fifth phase of development, and what we're calling the Transport and Regional Economic Simulation of Ontario, which is a new provincial model that we're building in Ontario that's designed to, to be iteratively developed over time. And like I said, the most interesting parts of this to me are you know, what's interesting about these two things. So I can talk roughly about an hour on each of these models within my, my 20 minutes of allocated time. So I'm gonna blow through these things real fast. So you're gonna have to listen fast as I go through this. So in Oregon, we have a multi-level model where we start up at the very top where we have an economic and demographic model that works on an interregional basis. So there's a couple of regions around the Pacific Northwest that this thing operates at. And then we come down and we do a synthetic population generation and, and a land development model. And the land development model you know, is meant to clear the market. And in order to do that, we have an activity allocation model that, that both allocates activities as well as acts as the broker in our simulation to, to make sure that the market does in fact clear. And once it does so, once it has the location choices made, then we can go through and we do the typical transport models where we have a person and commercial vehicle transport model, and which are both micro-simulated activity-based models, and they in turn feed a network analysis tool. Some of these models, or especially those towards the top, are aggregate equilibrium models, and those towards the bottom are all micro-simulation models, with the exception of our traffic assignment, where we go back to um, more of an aggregate. So some of you may know about um, a model that's been developed here in Europe called aggregate, disaggregate, aggregate, where, where you're moving across levels. This thing does very much the same sort of thing. It starts out in a base year, um, uh, about right now, and it runs through the time in annual time steps um, dictated by the location choice models, and, and you see a progression through time that looks very much like you would expect it to see, where the economic and land use models are, are getting some sort of measures of accessibility and disutilities from the transport models. And this thing steps through time in about four, 40 years into the future. And um, Michael, it takes th three, three and a half days to run this thing, about two and a half hours per, per year to run through, through this model. The design of the model is such that um, we had a group of about half a dozen people developing the model, and therefore all of the interactions between it are, are simply by comma-separated value files and an agreed-upon set of properties that the user can inspect and update as the simulation goes, because the last thing I wanted to do was have some sort of heavyweight but far more efficient data handling solution where I have a bunch of people that, that are constantly tripping over that. So in terms of organization of this thing, it is very um, pretty simple. Some of the modules are parallel processing, some of them are monolithic, and, and they all pretty much are written in Java. If you look at the individual models, they're every bit as complex as you would hope they would be. This is our person transport model, for example, and I won't belabor it other than to say that it looks like probably almost every other activity-based model that, that dates from about 20 years ago that, that you've seen, not as elegant as, as Tasha in, in many ways, but very much a, a state of the practice sort of thing that, that handles both short term, I mean short distance and long distance travel choices and, and feeds that into a traffic simulation. Likewise, on the commercial vehicle side, we start out with commodity flows that, that we get from the, the higher level models and, and we map them into different destinations and we include simulation of transshipment and drayage. In other words, if you're, if you're shipping on a different mode than truck, um, somehow we've got to get your goods to that if you don't happen to be conveniently located right next to a rail siding. 
And then we break it down and we generate discrete daily shipments that we put on discrete trucks and we move through a network. Um, the point being that each one of those little boxes up there has a fair amount of complexity and complicatedness associated with it. So we've just delivered this model, the second generation of this model. I'm going to show you a timeline here in a moment. Um, but we came up with a process where each of these things were developed individually and in a cross-sectional manner. And we started out with some ideas of what the model specification ought to look like and some calibration criteria. But then when this thing moves through time and, and, and it's running 40 years into the future, you kind of wonder, well, what am I going to benchmark this thing against? So we have some reasonability checks, and we had a series of about 40 things that we developed a, a, a graphics library in R to be able to look at the trajectory of the model through time so that we could take a look at it and, and both have internal as well as peer review review of this thing. So you may wonder, well, even if you could do that, why would you? And, and the why um, kind of flowed out of a set of policy meetings in the late 1990s where we met with policy analysts, legislative aides, department heads at the Department of Transport and things like that, and they all wanted to know or they claim to want to have known at the time about the interaction of land use and transport um, with respect to a lot of different changes. Changes in network supply, changes in retail location. There are urban growth boundaries in Oregon and we wanted to understand what would happen if we relaxed them or we kept them really, um, really stringently held. And we built the entire modeling system based on that premise of being able to answer that. Then we had, 12 years later, in 2010, PSU, Portland State University, where Kelly works, sponsored a, a policy symposium where everyone got back together again and talked about what, what are the really pressing issues. And they came up with a list of, of different issues that more or less didn't align with what we had earlier. So we decided, well, well, we'll take this and we'll run with this and see if we can make the, the modeling system morph with that. It was interesting in that 12-year time when we ran some of our applications, we, 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 we did look a lot of, at, at things like pricing and economic downturn and fuel scarcity, but the one thing we never did look at was the interaction of land use and transport. No one came to us with that kind of a question. And then in 2017, of course, um, everything has changed, and, and the big thing that has changed is mobility as a service and automated vehicles. And automated vehicles, of course, were science fiction five years ago, and, and nobody could be bothered to pay attention to automated vehicles and everything. Now, all of a sudden, everyone wants to know everything there is to know about automated vehicles and how they might do that. And that has completely changed the forecasting context, which I, I'll get to in a moment. Here's a bit about, about the timeline. When I, I, I've been asked for a long time to put together a timeline for this project, and I finally got around to doing it, and I was stunned to discover that, and I knew this in the back of my mind, but I was stunned to discover that 20 years have elapsed from the time we first sat down and talked to these policy analysts, and today. And, and, and so people like David Simmons and Michael Wegner, who are, are, peer, are among our peer reviewers, are like, what the heck have you been doing all that time, actually? Well, it, it turns out that we, we've done two generations. Our first was a kind of a proof of concept where we developed our model in urban, um, in Tranus at the statewide level. And we developed an, a, a model that became eventually known as urban sim at the urban level. And so um, right, right here in, in kind of the light, late 90s, Paul Waddell's work on our team is what became Urban Sim, and that ca caved off and went to something else. But about our first five years or so was spent just developing all of the data required to build this model and to get it operational and using it. And once we did, we had this thing called the Bridge Limitation Study, um, where the, the DOT director came to us and said, well, we've got this engineering problem in that we... we um, we, we sort of made a, a slight flaw in our specification of bridge designs 50 years ago, and now we've got 500 bridges in the state of Oregon that all suffer from this flaw. But we took this to the legislature and, and explained it to them, and they're not interested in the engineering aspects of this at all. So could we just couch this as an economic problem? 
So we did. We looked at network reliability and network degradation, and we looked at connectivity to markets and, and jobs and things like that and job retention. And, and all of a sudden, that became the compelling application of the statewide model. Then we decided we were going to develop a Gen 2 model. When, when we did that, that, that pretty much put urban sim on a separate path. And for reasons not worth going into, um, we decided we were going to develop a model called PICUS that I think a lot of you are familiar with. And, and the PICUS original design was about like right here, and it's kind of stretched out all the way over to here. And so that, that has kind of caused everything else to go along. We had a second freight bottleneck study, um, w which caused us to redefine some of the economic sectors and grab more commodity flow data and, and build this thing. And, and finally, we're down here at the very end, where interestingly enough, a lot of legislators are interested in knowing, well, how, what's the reliability of the network going to look like over time? What is its resilience in the event of a natural disaster? Because they, they've suddenly become obsessed with the fact that they're in an earthquake zone that looks as equally as, as vicious as the San Andreas Fault. And, and so we've been doing a lot of things to get us to that point. And, and that's kind of the story of that model. So taking all of the, what I'd learned from that, we started designing this model for Ontario. Well, the one thing that is very different about this model is that there is no land use model in here at all. Um, th there is a design for one, a concept for one, that, that may be you know, down the road or so. But the one thing I did learn in developing the statewide model in Oregon is that you do not want the big design up front followed by the long development period of building a model. You want to develop a model incrementally so that they have some operational capability very quickly, and you can quickly build upon it. And each time you build a new layer on this thing, it has to add value, demonstrable value to the, pro to the forecasting process in order to be continued. So this thing looks um, not a whole lot dissimilar to Oregon, where we have some common components up at the top. We have a big metropolitan area in, in, in Ontario called, called Toronto. They have a GTA model that Eric has built. This is a greater Toronto area. And the next bigger ring out is something called the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which I'll show you in a moment. And then there's the rest of the province. And so the Ministry of Transportation in Ontario decided, well, we'd like to have a bunch of different models to operate on this thing. And we, we kind of conspired with them to say, well, you really ought to have one population synthesis process. You really ought to have one firm synthesis process. You really ought to have one macroeconomic model and networks, coding standards and stuff like that. So um, we said, OK, well, we did that. And I don't know what, where the colors went in this thing. Um, the legends here actually have colors on them. And I could show you my, the computer if you, to prove it, but I, I guess it won't destroy anything. Just like in Oregon, we have some modules in here that are aggregate models, and we have others that are micro-simulated. But we go through and we do a, a macroeconomic set of forecasts, and then we have a commodity flow model, a long-distance truck model, an urban truck model. And then we satisfy the long-distance travel first with a set of models that, that Rolf and his crew here are working on that is kind of an out growth of work that we've done in other places in the USA, so that we explicitly model resident long distance travel and visitor travel into the province. And then we have a separate model for southern Ontario, which is more of an activity-based formulation, but not as sophisticated as what Eric is doing. And, and we also have a, a model for northern Ontario, which has the great benefit of being totally bereft of any travel data whatsoever. So we, we can totally assert a model for Northern Ontario, and no one can prove us wrong. And so we thought, well, with, with, the, with the lack of transit choices that they have up there and relatively straightforward um, network choices, we would use a trip-based model there in, and try to economize. All this goes into a bi-level network analysis that, that I'll show you in a moment. And unlike in Oregon, we have a couple of very explicit ideas about how we're going to do cost-benefit analysis and uh, some additional network analyses, and so we've developed post-processors for those. The idea of the bi-level model was that we could look at long-distance travel, both for persons and commodities, at, at kind of a higher level, and maybe we'd look at that in a weekly basis, and you needed a very coarse network representation of a very large area in order to do that.
But when we wanted to take a look at Ontario, we could have a more detailed model that only focused on the area that we were interested in. And, and we're still grappling with this issue right now um, because we're about two-thirds of the way through the project of, of getting this first-generation model up and coming. And right before I left to come here, um, the, the MTO decided, well, maybe we need to shift gears on this thing again, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And, and so that's kind of a work in progress. The other thing that, that has really worked, I think, for us well is this reuse of components that are common to most models. So we call this common modeling elements. And as I mentioned, this is the population synthesis, the firm synthesis, or macro models. We eventually want to add to that land use data, but in, we need to think a little bit more about how we're going to do land use modeling, or even if MTO, our, our client there, even is interested in doing so. One thing that's very challenging about Ontario that, that kind of threw us off was its sheer size. And not only its size, but the, the differing density of activity. So this is, this is Detroit here, this is Montreal, New York City's here, and this is southern Ontario right here, and Toronto, and 80% and of everyone that lives in Ontario and works in Ontario does so in this little white area here called Southern Ontario. And of course, it's all very much concentrated there in the GTA. But of course, 80% of the land area happens to be outside of that, way up in the north, um, where there is either very little activity or, or there is none for hundreds of miles. And to put this into context a little bit, um, Alaska is the biggest state that anyone would probably try to model. Ontario is only slightly smaller than Alaska. I mean, this is a very big land area, and it has a very big network footprint. Um, then you see Texas and California and Oregon. And, and one thing that's interesting about it is that Ontario is as big as Texas and California combined in land area. But in terms of population, this is Ontario here with their 13 million people. Texas up here, California with their 59 people. There's Oregon right there. Makes it, should make it easier to hit that nail, right? And then there's Alaska down there. So the, the, the diversity of activity and the scale at which it occurs in this particular model is just mind-boggling to me. Um, like the great folks in Oregon, they came up with a set of requirements for the model, and unlike Oregon, they came up with three times many more than the folks in Oregon did, which makes this a very challenging sort of thing. And this list is only two years old, so we've only been through one iteration with them until two weeks ago when they were like, OMG, we got to get ahead of this automated vehicle thing and this mobility as a service thing, and that's, that has some big implications for what we might do. So what have I learned about this, or what do I think some of the common threads are? I broke them down into three areas, found foundational sort of things, design things, and methodological things. And I would say to you that my experience with these two models in particular, but everything that I've done to date, makes me convinced that when you build some of these models and you try to put them in practice in a policy, public policy arena like I do, that you have to have a champion within the agency. A consultant is not an acceptable substitute for a champion, no matter how brilliant the consultant is. And the champion is, has to be more than the money bags. It has to be someone that has a vision for what they want to accomplish, and they have to, have, they have to think in terms of what Oregon or Ontario is going to look like 20 years hence, and think about the sort of things that policymakers want to know. The other thing that I found that is absolutely essential and what differentiates successes from not so much successes is a, an effective peer review panel. And they have to be involved at the outset where they influence the design as well as watching how the model develops you know, as it moves down the road. On the design side, um, I guess I have to admit that it took me a long time to get my mind around this as well, but I, I, I loved being given a modeling problem and being able to go disappear somewhere and develop a cool model. But if you stop and think about it, there's a bigger political context for which needs information, and they usually are looking for some sort of a forecast, 
which in turn ought to define the model that is used, which in turn ought to dictate the code. And many of us insert here at the code, the model or the code part, and we lose track of the big forecasting thing. And so the big thing right now with these automated vehicles is, is um, what the deputy minister was telling me is that, well, I don't really care how good your model is at explaining behavior, even complex behavior. I, I get that people make decisions for very complicated reasons, but the two of us know, because there are only two of us in a conversation, the two of us know that people are going to make decisions differently in an automated vehicle future than they make right now. That knowing how they make decisions right now is only marginally useful when people are making decisions completely differently in the future, when they see time and cost and some of these other factors that we've talked about in a completely different way. And yes, Rolf, I'm, getting, I'm, 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 I'm moving as fast as I can. Um, the, the other thing that I, I, I found out is that you have to have an agile mindset, and I'll show you an idea about that. And then there's this problem of parameter storm. So all of our policymakers are telling us, I, you know, even, even you, Rick, can hit this. But I don't want to know where that point is going to be in the future anymore. I want to know, I want, I want a bunch of forecasts all, all over this cone right here that shows me what the full magnitude of likely futures might be. And I want to know where my project fits in that. Or I want to know where my policy, you know, helps on that, you know, et cetera. Now, this is annoying because this does have color and the other ones didn't. Well, at any rate, so, so w when I start thinking in terms of, of that type of a po of forecasting sort of thing, I think about, well, we have data and assumptions and models like we used to in the past. And when once we understand what the issues are, we can identify the risk factors that we need to simulate and we can build some tools and everything. And we can accumulate some performance measures but because we're looking at things in the future where, where no one has any idea what an automated vehicle um, future looks like, we could have AV hell where, where um, automated vehicles simply become substitutes for conventional vehicles. Now they allow us to suburbanize even further out because travel time isn't quite the disutility it is right now. Or we could have AV nirvana or we could have somewhere in between then there's energy prices. There, there, there happens to be this thing called the second machine age, which postulates that a lot of us, um, perhaps many of us in this room, um, might be replaced by artificial intelligence or, or, or more AI-related automation. All kinds of those things are flowing into this, and, and policymakers want to know what is the mix of all of these things. So I have to run my model not once, but I have to run it 60 times or so to, to exercise the full range of all these alternatives. And the type of models I've shown you before are just terrible at doing that. Now, the nice thing is, is that I can, do, I can make the 60 model runs with my Oregon model in the same three and a half days it takes me to make one run. I just have to run 60 AWS servers all at one time and collect all the results and do my meta-analysis based on that. But really, what I find and, and I'm increasingly being asked this, um, first in Oregon, but it's getting really annoyingly, frustratingly um, frequent in Ontario, is I want to know, if you run these 60 things, how many different futures will my project survive? Because if my project only works in a couple of them, then I'm going to go take my money elsewhere. And if it survives most of them, I, I'm interested in doing something else like that. So this is the kind of the model that I need to come to. And I, and I would point out to you that the peer review panel, w which is kind of maroon colored here, they have a lot of places that they need to plug in in order to do this, as well as Delphi processes and things like that that help us assert what behavior might be occurring in the future, because we certainly don't have data on them now. When I think about incremental model development or agile development for Ontario, we said, instead of having one model that is beautifully specified, peer-reviewed, elegant, and everything else like that, why don't you have like three or four models that over that same time period where you incrementally step up to your desired capability? And so we, we kind of put this thing out and used it to inform us. 
But to look at it in an activity, and this is where color would really have been nice, but um, you start with, this is Maryland, where we went, decided we wanted to go from a traditional trip-based model to an activity-based model. So you have a re regular trip-based model, and you say, well, I'll, I'll maybe micro-simulate population synthesis and autoavailability, and I'll have the rest of it being traditionally an aggregate model. And then you just keep moving down here until you eventually back your way in and maybe along the way, you might change from a static DTA to an analytical DTA, or I mean a static traffic assignment to an analytical DTA, and so on and so forth. But having a roadmap like this and having buy-in is, is indispensable to us. And then there's this thing I call parameter swarm. So I, I've allocated, um, with a fair amount of work, come up with all the parameter, a, a count of all the parameters required to run these two models. So this is Oregon over here in this set of columns, and this is Ontario, which is still a work in progress, so take it with a grain of salt. And here's all the different components. So I have two types of comp um, parameters that are properties that need to be supplied to this model. Some of them are calibrated, and, and they're, they're handled by developers. And they can be a single number, they can be a vector of numbers, they could be a table of numbers, um, they, they could be any number of things, but there are 274 individual things that had to be developed, calibrated, asserted, or, or, or just simply made up in order to feed this model. And, uh, and 64 of them, um, some of which are simple as project title or scenario number, but often, you know, when the simulation begins, it ends, and time steps and everything else like that have to be set in order to run this modeling system. And I thought, I am not making the same mistake in Ontario. Well, I, I was stunned to count them all up. Everything to date, we're already up to 202 and, and 48. So, so what, I'm a third less than I was before. So education does count for something. But the problem is, is that Rolf is working on these long distance models and I don't know how many parameters he's gonna have yet. Um, but this is a heavyweight model, right? And, and um, I, I think this is a real problem. Real fast, on the methodological side, you'll be happy to know I don't have any slides for this. Um, I think we're moving from a point where, and, and, and we're long overdue to do so, where we move from econometric estimation of models to models that have a theory basis, so that when the model moves through time and we're trying to look at it, it, it either follows the theory or it doesn't. But it doesn't help to know whether it follows the econometrics or not. And, and so I, I think that, that's a big issue. Another thing that we're dealing with is replicating, which all travel modelers are obsessed with replicating traffic counts, as you know, rather than increasing their knowledge and understanding. That's an issue. And then we have this thing, what I call the development tortoise versus the, um, the, the user requirement here. And, and my point there is, is that the needs over the life of the Tulumit model changed so fast that the developers had no prayer of keeping up with them. And, it's, and, it, and it keeps on happening again and again and again. We thought, well, we'll be smart. We'll have a little army of tortoises they're all moving in parallel that are nicely orchestrated to arrive at the same point. But the problem is the hairs are tagged heaving as well. And, and we just, we, we have a modeling paradigm that just won't keep up. So for me, I say, well, there's several things that we've got going well for us. We've got great client champions, I think. There's probably broad acceptance of what we're doing. Um, especially in the policy arena, I'm gratified to see that there's no longer a question of whether this is a good investment to make or not, it's a question of, well, how fast can you use it? And what can you use it for? And I think that's, that's very good. We've got a lot of experience building these things, and so we know something about them. Um, we're getting better at thinking about multi-scale models, and I think that's gonna be really important in the future. And we have better tools, both on the software side and, and thing, and we've got big data. Five years ago, um, you know, I was struggling to find data, now I'm drowning in it. So that's great. And, and, and because we're starting to think about models that run 60 different alternative futures instead of one, it has to mean the end of the reductionist mindset that we've had where we're just endlessly wanting more and more detail 
but not really producing models that are that much more accurate or that much more policy sensitive as a result. Now, on the bad side, um, this fast-changing context means that, there, that none of you, much less me, can keep up with the changing policy requirements that these people have with the way we currently develop models. Um, and there's an acceptance of that as well. And, and they understand that the world of the future is going to be so much dramatically different than anything we, any of us have seen over our careers that, that that creates a second kind of acceptance problem. The complexity and the complicatedness of our models um, brings me to this one last thing here that I'll stop with, which is the dependence on the developer. Because these two models, especially PICUS, if you don't have Doug and John on speed dial, most agencies can't use the model. If they want to do something they have never done before, it is difficult for them to do so. And I found that that is true of probably all the models that we're dealing with, despite every attempt I've made to try to usefully integrate the, the decision maker um, and, and, and the end client into the model development process. We, we develop models that are still too hard for them to get their minds around. And so it, the, the model and the developer seem to be insufferable, and I would love to figure out a way to break that. And that's kind of the end of my story. Ten minutes too late, but th that's it. Um, you could actually blame Rolf because he gave me too big of a topic to do in 20 minutes. So, um, <laughs> and the nice thing about it is there's no time left for, for um, questions. So. Oh, yes, there is. You're not off the hook yet. There Thank is? you, Rick. This was super, super. Thanks for the review of, of these two models. I opened the floor for... Comments. Oh no. Comment to, to your very last, very last statement. I mean, we have met some open source, and we keep getting questions. And uh, sometimes people haven't even run a Java program before, and you kind of need to teach them every step. But we see from time to time groups that bring up huge models. I think the, the Dublin model, model came out of nothing and the, what is it, two, one or two other places where people actually are able to take this, never ask a single question, and build great models out of it. So people are out there who are able to use this stuff without asking. I, I, I would tend to totally agree with you. Um, they can get to a certain point pretty easily. Of, op, of interim operational capability. But then when you ask them in, in, in Matsum, for example, well, how are we gonna simulate automated vehicles? Then, then they throw up their hands. But I, I totally agree with you. The thing that I'm encouraged about now is that we're bringing people through school that understand micro simulation. And, and I totally agree with what I think you said earlier, Rolf, about the utility of micro simulation. To me, um, it, it's almost heretical to say that, but, but for activity-based travel models, I believe that the only benefit are, are when you need to do pricing, equity analyses, and when you have really complicated transit choices. But in most other instances, there, I haven't found them to be that much more compelling than a more aggregate model. But the really big benefit of it, which transcends all of that to me, is the micro-simulation, that you can do data mining on, on these things and you can add attributes and you can add new behavior much faster. And, and I think that's a, that's a huge thing. And I think that Kai as more and more people come out that, that have that mindset. Um, I think that is changing for us. There's just too few of them out there yet. In that spirit of adding functionality quickly, we actually have done quite a lot of work on the AVs, so they would find it now if they wanted to do it in Matson. But that wasn't really my question. My question was, what to do about the, the champion. How do you find that ideal person which has that 15-year time horizon with, with the authority, will not be promoted out of his job, will not leave it, will not find a new wife partner which takes him to I don't know where. So how do you find that sponsor? I have champion. no idea. Um, I, you know, Rolf and I have you know, banged our heads against the wall about this, thinking about that. And, and that's the, that, that is what happened to us in Oregon, was the champion retired. 
And when the champion retired, not long after the 2010 policy um, refresh, it changed the whole complexion of, of the program and it, it was sort of still going in the same direction, but um, it's just different. Maybe not different in a bad way, but, but different. And, and I, I don't know that. I, I think that the only thing that comes to my mind, the only thing that makes sense to me, Kai, is to say that, well, we, we can make champions by show them, showing them really compelling success stories that we're able to do with our models, things, things that are very cool that we could not do before. And, and somehow being in an audience that, that would see what we're doing that. But I don't know. But on a more positive note, I mean, these people come and go, right? So Bill Upton retired, but then you have someone like Dave Ory who came into the play and, and is building great models. I think the same happens at the university, right? I mean, people like Michael Wegener retire and they're not necessarily immediately replaced with someone good, but some, some other time, someone strong comes up again. That's a, that's a natural. I want to come to another point in your presentation. You said... Well, well wait a minute. Let, 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 let me say, say something to that. I, you, you're, you're right about that. Um, one, one of the guys that I work with in the Department of Defense is of the idea that, well, it, it takes an outlier to develop an integrated modeling system like we have. And you're expecting an outlier to be everywhere you see. And, and, I, and I accept that. that. That's probably true. I'm, I'm sorry, but... Go on. I would like to ask about the peer review you talked about. Um, and let me put it a little bit provocative. So you were somewhat critical, criticizing the Oregon approach, yet Oregon had a very strong peer review panel. What is the role of a panel? How much can a panel guide the development process? Could it also be peer reviewed publication that can guide you? Or do you need a panel of people that, that guides your model development? Well, I guess it depends on how, uh, how much the client or, or the clients listen or take stock in the peer review panel, but I would say that I, I didn't mean to be critical of the process in Oregon. I think to the fact that Oregon succeeded at all was only due to the fact that they had a peer review pe panel that keep them focused on asking the important design questions early on. and being sort of critical, you know, about things. And sometimes they were at a very high level. And sometimes I, you know, they, they, they really got into it. You know, like Paul Waddell would put up some econometric estimation and they would just take it apart term by term. Um, but having them there to design things along the way, because we came in full of ambition and, and then, you know, Michael comes in and says, well, we've done that actually four times before and it's been a raging failure every time. You know, and then another time it came along and said, oh, we're going to do this. And David would come in and say, well, that's going to be a dumpster fire. And, and so, you know, that kind of dis... They had no horse in the race. They, they simply wanted to see a good thing happen. Um, I think was totally invaluable. And I think that Ontario will regret not having a similar sort of thing in the future in an maybe sooner rather than later. But um, o Oregon, I, I would assert to you, would never have lasted this long without peer review panel. Any other comments, questions? You guys want cookies, I know what it is. <laughs> uh, I wonder about the 60 simulations you mentioned, how you come up with 60? Are they 60 different scenarios? And um, if so, who was involved on actually thinking about scenarios? I, I'm sorry, say that again, please? Th you mentioned uh, about running 60 times the model yes. in your presentation. I wonder what this 60 means. Are these 60 different scenarios? Um, if we say that fuel prices could be operating over a certain range, and, and we say that um, you could have different levels of autonomous, semi-autonomous, and traditional vehicles if you assume three or four different types of employment outcomes. They want to run all different combinations of those. And they want to do it for two reasons. Number one, they want to find out, well, which of these things are we worrying about that it really doesn't make a difference in, in terms of how the simulation um, comes out? And which of these things are really important and one thing that, that they 
everyone thought that, and, I, and I'm sure it's probably because the, the, we don't have very sophisticated AV modeling techniques right now, but the thing that dwarfs them all is the assumptions about what will happen with social change associated with automation and artificial intelligence and what might happen to the various age and, and, and lifestyle cohorts in the model. What assumptions you make about them almost dwarf every other you know, technical assumption in the, in the model, and we were stunned by that. We, we had no idea it would be that big of a difference. And so that's why they want to look at all of those different options, because they're saying, well, if I have something that only will last, will only work in a couple of different assumptions, I, I want to ditch that because not only do we not know when, what's going on in the future, we're sure you don't either. Uh, I would like to support that. Um, I will later show uh, our uh, most recent uh, set of scenarios and uh, their number is 52. Yeah, and uh, uh, we would have liked if we had had more time really to take some of them and fine tune them by different parameters, different assumptions, different policies in order to get them better than they were uh, on our first attempt. Yeah, and that of course implies uh, that they can be calculated fast. I will talk about that. You guys have no idea how weird this feels with this thing on. Wait till you get up here. You look a bit like Madonna. Um, <laughs> the, the, one of the analogies that I would draw with the complexity and the, the number of scenarios is the kind of world of climate modeling, which is as uncertain, if not infinitely more so, as the outcomes of this kind of modeling. And, and this kind of ensemble approach, where all they do is throw massive amounts of computing power at it and run thousands of different variations and then it's somewhere in that enormous range is the truth and but what happens with climate models is generally people just take the the mean and say yeah we'll just use that one value for all of our work that we do from here on in is there a danger that by having more and more scenarios with these kinds of models that then decision makers will just say oh well I'll just take the average or the highest or the lowest and not really fully consider what that range might mean well, you know, when we got into this game, they, they used to do that. When we first started building these models, they used to do that. But recently, especially as the private investors have started getting involved and they're looking at these P3 partnerships, um, they no longer are willing to look at just the average. They, they, they really do want to know how, they want to know how many of these different outcomes does my project policy, investment, whatever, survive in. And so it has been refreshing to see them get away from that. And, and now, even in, in Ontario, we're talking about this, they, they no longer want to see a forecast. Because they want to see, where's the rest of them? You know, let, and let us understand how they differ and, and be informed by that. So I, I'm sort of encouraged by that. So, so does that then make the opportunity to use a model as a conversation starter a really good thing? That if, if you have a fast and simple model that you can go into a room and discuss the, the ins, inputs and outputs and not the 202 parameters, but the one parameter that matters maybe. So you can use the model yeah. to have a conversation. Is that, does well, that I, give us more power or less power? <laughs> as, I, as I'm less far more worried about that because the parameter space in these models are vast, even the smaller models. And you know what to do about that is, I, I, I totally take that to heart. Just a comment on the, the parameter swarm. I, I, mean, I, I agree. I, I was once uh, having lunch at a conference with Jeffrey West from Santa Fe Institute, who, of course, background is in physics, and I was describing, you know, you know, sort of our econometric models and how a mode choice model might have 40 or 50 or 60 parameters in it, and he almost literally dropped his fork. Yeah. And and he said, "Oh my God, man! And you call that science?" <laughs> uh, you know. So, you know, I think there's reasons why we need fair number of parameters sometimes, but I, I do think we have, we have uh, somehow lost control. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because bankers have the exact same reaction to that. Yeah. And, and as Kai knows, um, I, um, Kai helped out on a peer review panel in Oregon 
I mean, in California, we were looking at high-speed rail, and, and he got to do peer review. I got to be in court for two years, ex you know, explaining to judges and, and lawyers, you know, about these models, and they all have the same, exact same reaction. Oh, my gosh. Like, like are, are there, like, five of those that are important and, and the rest that could just be kind of, you know, grouped together? They, it just blows their minds. So I wanted to ask you about a statement you made where um, a few slides back where you said theory, sort of, you sort of said theory against econometrics. That's Estimation, sort of yes. Op opposites. And I guess in my simple mind, I always thought of econometrics as based in theory and, and in, in, in some ways as um, the opera, opera, and now I'm not going to be able to say the word, um, operationalization of theory. But you presented it as um, a different approach. So could you elaborate on what you mean by, by the model driven by theory and not econometrics? Yes, but before I answer that, I'm going to move close to the door so when you start throwing glasses and other sharp objects at me, I can escape out of here without being hit. But um, what I mean by that, and I, I, don't, I, I have a great deal of respect for the work of a lot of people in this room, and I, I've seen some very brilliant formulations and explanations of their models. But too many times I've seen models where, well, here it is, I, I ran it through estimation, this is statistically significant, and therefore it must be retained in the model. Or the other way around, um, a little bit of our dirty laundry from Tulumip, when Paul Waddell started estimating models of residential, um, tr residential choice, um, Michael and David probably remembered that, accessibility was a statistically insignificant term. But we had this big, long argument, well, but we know that it's important. It has to be in the model sort of thing. That, that's one end. You know, I'm, I just have this cognitive bias that it's got to be that way. And then the other end is, is um, um, other members of, of my Tulumip team who can remain nameless would get up there and they'd have this big, long thing with 40 terms in it. And they'd say, all these terms are statistically significant. And so someone like Michael would come along and say, well, so what's that going to look like in the future? And you say, I don't know, that's my problem. Be because so many times now, you know, when you're looking at these models and they're stepping through time and everything else like that, and they go into orbit around Neptune, you say, well, what was it doing when it, when it departed for that? You know, why did it do that? And we just don't know what the interaction effects are. And if we can't explain them, I, I have a hard time having them in my models. All right, not, I, I am not a critic of econometric estimation of models, and I see why they're important when they add knowledge and, and when we can explain it. But the, the big thing that we seem to lack is kind of a unified theory of land use transport interaction and, and understanding those kinds of surfaces, and I would very much challenge everyone that we really got to better understand that before our acceptance level is going to go up significantly. Super. Thank you very much, Rick. Again, another presentation at the core of the topic of the workshop. Super. You're welcome. Thank you.